This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. The European Union's unveiled a proposal to ban all Russian oil imports by the end of the year as part of a sixth round of sanctions over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen spoke Wednesday. Today, we are addressing our dependency on Russian oil. And let's be clear, it will not be easy, because some member states are strongly dependent on Russian oil. But we simply have to do it. So today, we will propose to ban all Russian oil from Europe. This will be... This will be a complete import ban on all Russian oil seaborne and pipeline, crude and refined. Under the proposal, EU member nations would phase out crude oil imports within six months and refined oil imports by the end of the year. The European Union is considering giving exemptions to Hungary and Slovakia to allow them to keep importing Russian oil for a longer period of time, because they're so dependent on it. On Wednesday, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov responded to the proposed ban. Uh, the sanction aspirations of the Americans, Europeans and other countries, this is a double-edged weapon. In trying to harm us, they too have to pay a heavy price. They're already doing it, paying a big price. And the cost of these sanctions for European citizens will increase every day. To talk more about the EU's proposed ban on Russian oil, we're joined by Timothy Milovanov. He is president of the Kiev School of Economics and associate professor at University of Pittsburgh, former minister of economic development, trade and agriculture of Ukraine under President Zelensky. We welcome you back to Democracy Now!, Tim. Um, if you can start off by just responding to this announcement this week of the total Russian oil ban by the European Union, though there will be some exceptions. That has been in the books or in planning for a while, and I personally have been on a number of groups which have been discussing the details of it. Um, there are a lot of details because uh, on paper it looks good, on in practice you need to have uh, these waivers and you need to discuss what really constitutes Russian oil. For example, if you buy some Russian oil and mix it with non-Russian oil, at which percentage it stops being Russian oil. So there will be tons of attempts to bypass it, but uh, hopefully the final document will be uh, sufficiently proper that this uh, ban is implementable. And what do you think, Tim, what would the effects of this ban be? Financial on Russia, it will lose several hundred million uh, a day. And to put it in perspective, um, Russia recently paid a coupon on its uh, foreign debt, and there was a discussion of default or not. And the total uh, payment was uh, between six and 700 million euros. So, you know, we are talking about uh, Russia today uh, in daily receipts from uh, the EU uh, getting much more then it is spending, and uh, regardless of the sanctions, uh, it has enough liquidity to continue to finance the war. So it's a step forward. Uh, but uh, it also receives a lot of funding from gas, and that will continue to be uh, sold to Europe. So some of the funding will continue to go to Russia. And what about how do you respond to those who say, in fact, that Russia will just find alternative buyers uh, uh, once this goes into effect, uh, China, possibly India? In theory, uh, that's how we teach economics in classes. In practice, it depends on logistics and the politics uh, of the relationship with other countries. So China cannot simply, you know, increase uh, the capacity to pump through the existing pipelines. And so there are some limits. And uh, uh, India, well, there could be ways to deliver that, but India is also trying to navigate uh, relationships with other countries. And in this package and in the discussions I have been a part of, there have been uh, mechanisms suggested to encourage other countries not to help Russia bypass. And furthermore, data shows that uh, already Russia's um, experts in oil in terms of actual volume, not prices, but volume, has dropped uh, during the war by 30 percent, which shows that de facto sanctions are already taking place. So uh, it's a theoretical construction that they will simply 
substitute uh, different buyers. Even if Russia substitutes different buyers, what about Europe and the countries that it will become more reliant on? Uh, they talk about the reason, of course, for cutting off the um, oil uh, from Russia is because of what Russia has done in Ukraine uh, and supporting democracy, not autocracy. But turning to places like Oh, Saudi Arabia. It's now understood that William Burns, the CIA director, just made a secret trip there. That is correct. Um, the many of the suppliers of oil and the alternative suppliers, they are regimes. Uh, the question, however, is unfortunately we're dealing in the world with regimes, and some of these regimes are with aggressive military powers, and ours are not. So, you know, the calculus is that for the time being, while the Russia continues to be an aggressive military power, uh, we have to be dealing with uh, less aggressive states. Uh, and we will have to find a way to uh, build the future with Russia when it is not uh, using the military force that aggressively. And Tim, could you talk about the uh, political and also symbolic significance of Germany uh, coming out in supporting this ban, Germany itself uh, very reliant on Russian oil, though, of course, uh, uh, there have been reports that Germany agreed to this only once it had found alternative sources. Uh, but Germany's position on Russia has been very different uh, over the last several decades. So what is the significance of, of Germany uh, taking this position now? That is true. It's a seismic shift, I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in many ways, it's scandalous that uh, uh, a very prudent country, Germany, has come to depend so much on one supplier um, and uh, prior to the war. And entering the war, the position of Germany was that we need to find uh, the future um, solution to the situation in Europe, to the security, through negotiations with Russia. And that perhaps has not been aired publicly, but they, even I have heard it many times in private conversations with members of parliament, of the EU representatives of German political elites. Uh, and now they have turned, um, the, the table has turned and they have s uh, switched their position. And that, to me, signifies that their belief is now that diplomatic solution is not going to be effective and that the Russia is playing a different game and it has to be stopped by force. So in that sense, it's much more significant than the pure economic uh, implication of the ban. It's a political change in Germany. And Timothy Milovonov, can you talk about the pipelines that go through Ukraine and what this means for them going to Europe, providing much of the oil to Europe. Many people don't realize that those pipelines are continuing, uh, Ukraine continuing to pay Russia, um, uh, or Russia continuing to pay Ukraine for allowing this to go through Ukraine. Correct. Um, there are two uh, types of supplies which go through Ukraine and through other countries, but uh, um, there are major pipelines, an oil pipeline, uh, and the Ukrainian, um, what is called GTS, it's a gas transportation system. Um, there is um, a significant income, well, significant on, on the order of uh, several billion dollars, coming uh, on the rent, so on the payments for this transportation. Not so much in oil, but more so in gas. So oil is less of an issue. But if you put it in a perspective, two or three billion dollars is uh, approximately one percent of the Ukrainian GDP. And we are suffering and losing, you know, 40, 50 percent of GDP now, according to different forecasts, including the World Bank report uh, from the war. So, you know, we will uh, we will do what it takes. We are happy and ready to stop uh, and enforce the embargo together with others. So this one percent is uh, is insignificant and shouldn't even be compared relative to the lives that you know that are lost in in because of the war. Tim, could you explain? You said earlier that uh, Germany has given up on the prospect of uh, diplomacy with Russia. Why is that? And finally, uh, May 9th, uh, what do you expect to happen on uh, Victory Day in Russia? What steps might Russia take then? There are different cultural or cultures, cultural codes. You know, the West is trying to build the future of as prosperous and free economies and societies. Uh, whereas Russia is, has become, unfortunately, for, for the world, 
uh, in a sense, a collector of land. So, you know, it's hard to, uh, to, to have a diplomatic solution if you are pursuing, you know, very different objectives and you're just not even understanding each other. You have different, uh, different perspectives on what the, what the value of the, of the future is. And I think uh, Germany has, to, has come to realize that Russia is just simply thinking differently uh, about what diplomacy is. The diplomacy for Russia is about uh, kind of creating a narrative uh, which supports its uh, forceful capture of lands. Unfortunately, Russia believes that the force is first and diplomacy is second, whereas the civilized world has learned that the force doesn't work and diplomacy should go first. May 9 is an important date for the uh, Soviet Union history. It's an official uh, victory day. And by the way, I, I think Russia has uh, kind of expropriated or exploited the Soviet Union legacy. Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union, and many, many Ukrainians died in the World War II defending the Soviet Union and fighting Nazis. So we are as entitled uh, to the legacy of the Soviet Union as Russia is trying to claim. Uh, they are not the only... Uh, uh, party to to the Soviet Union, uh, but uh, I think they will try to c claim or declare some kind of victory for its domestic uh, audience, and that means that most likely uh, they'll do something really nasty in Mariupol and maybe the east of Ukraine. It's unlikely they will be able to achieve any of their strategic objectives, such as uh, encircling the Ukrainian troops or capturing a large uh, area in the east of Ukraine. Um, even though it looked like uh, it was a plan. So I expect a lot of bombardments, a lot of missiles uh, in the next week, and something very patriotically, quote-unquote, symbolic of the Soviet Union in Mariupol and elsewhere. Um, and, uh, of course, the Russian foreign minister has denied that Putin will, as uh, was predicted by some, declare war on Ukraine on Victory Day. But I have to ask you, Timmy, uh, Tim, Timothy uh, Villanovov, Milovonov, <laughs> before you leave, we're talking to you like an economist, like we talk to economists around the world. But you are not just a typical armchair analyst right now. You're the president of the Kiev School of Economics. You're in Kiev. How is your family dealing with this? How are you? How are you affected? Well, you know, yeah, you're correct. So we started the fundraising effort and raised uh, tens of millions of dollars, actually $23 million, to, and we're supplying everything from medical kits to bulletproof vests and, uh, you know, sorry, but please uh, support Ukraine and support us. But emotionally, you know, we cry, we, 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 we have nightmares, we, you know, we got used to the—we're used now to air uh, sirens, uh, uh, you know, it's it's like it's a blur since February 24th. We, we are exhausted, and uh, every time we we read about a friend who died or uh, a, a, a not a friend but just a, someone who was raped or tortured, and it's coming daily. You know, you can't shut it off. We are inside of this. You know, like there are bombs around us, missiles landing. You know, every night I, I, I hear from someone. I even hear that sometimes. I haven't been hit yet personally, and I've been very fortunate, but a lot of my friends have. Many died. Many of our alumni and students died, you know. Some have been tortured. So, you know, how do you, like, I, I, life goes on. We fight, we resist, we want to win, or we want to survive as the nation. So we work, we fight, we persevere. I think we talk to you, and thank you for having us. Thank you for giving us voice. Well, Timothy Milovonov, we want to thank you very much for being with us, um, president of the Kiev School of Economics, associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and former minister of economic development and tr trade and agriculture of Ukraine, speaking to us from Western Ukraine. Coming up, Yale professor Tim Snyder. He says Russia's war in Ukraine is a colonial war. Stay with us, and Tim, stay safe.